Hi, my name is. Uh, I got the hi, my name is part. Just start with the the story about the difference between the two. Okay. Yeah, I was asked to kind of discuss what the K model B twenty six meant to me and what was special about it, and I feel that to understand what was special about it, it would help to know what it was replacing. And the I flew B twenty sixes as a navigator in. Vietnam in 1963. The aircraft over there had come from a number of different sources, a number of different places, and they were in various degrees of flyability. <clears throat> there were probably three or four different configurations of the airplane when you looked at the outside. Sometimes in the gun nose there would be six machine guns. Sometimes there would be eight in a row like that. Two airplanes had wing sets of wing guns, six in the thing. So the number of machine guns in the aircraft could range from six to 14. On the inside, the switches were not all in the same place. The lighting was different. We had in one case, we had lighting that was your best like black light, fluorescent thing. And if you got that in your eyes, you felt kind of strange. <clears throat> the communications equipment was old Korean War vintage VHF systems that didn't always work. The headsets wouldn't fit right. So it was kind of a challenge to, to, to get in the airplane and do what you want. Also, the uh, armament systems were not always working right in the same. I had examples uh, of coming, coming in for a landing. We had lost the rudder, we shot out, and we started leveling out the flaps so we could get it at a proper, nice control speed. The flaps quit, so we had to land very fast. My, my pilot, Tom Smith, did a beautiful job, brought us in. I st however, I still remember going over the approach end of the runway at a very strange vertical position rather than the horizontal you were normally at. <clears throat> that was one case. We had, uh, I had cases of, I had to pump down the gear because the hydraulic systems wouldn't work. I had a case in which the hydraulic system in the aircraft got a pinhole leak and we were basically atomized in the cockpit with hydraulic fluid. So it, it was always a challenge. Uh, the guns sometimes would act strangely. First over there, we had machine guns in the nose that to activate them, you had to pull a cable. That got to be boring. They went to a pneumatic system that was nice. But sometimes the pneumatic system acts strange. One time, tech coming off a target, I recharged the guns. That meant I activated the pneumatic system and put in a, a new round, let the uh, air go through, cool off the machine gun, put a new round in and let it go out. Unfortunately, we were pulling off, and as I released the switch, the machine guns went off. And it happened twice before I realized it. And there was a C-123 aircraft flying right in front of us. And the machine gun fired. The tracers went right underneath him. And he started reporting heavy and intense enemy aircraft fire. And we told him not to worry. We'll take care of it. I mean, that's an example of some of the strange things that happen. But the worst things that happen are the wings had come off. We lost at least one airplane over there when the wing came off. Subsequently lost one here in the, in the States. We also had an aircraft that if you were in a diving, diving bombing, and you had the bomb bays open, you're dropping something, and you pull back in the yoke, the airplane would not correct. It kept going down. So the nav gets up and shuts down the bomb bay and, and tries to do everything else, see what's going on, and all of a sudden the plane recovers it. So that plane wasn't allowed to be flown. They took it up in the test flight, and the tail fell off. 
So we lost two guys that way. That was the condition of the B. And uh, we also had some RBs over there that uh, were flying, but I didn't get too involved with them. Now, the comm systems were, like I said earlier, very ancient, very unreliable. The K model, now, significant difference in the K model is they structurally reinforced the wings. They added more powerful engines. The big change was they standardized the cockpits. If you went in any tail number and you reached over, same button would do the same thing, same switch would do the same thing, lightings were the same. But the big improvement to me was the communication systems. We had VHF, UHF, FM radios, and HF radios, highly unusual for Air Force aircraft, strike aircraft, to have FM radios. That was used for air to ground to uh, provide discussions with the Army or other people on the ground. And most Air Force aircraft didn't have that. We did, and it played a significant role on what the K was able to do. The organization I went over with, I was in the organization for three years before I went over with the K models. We trained together. One significant thing we had, we had training in uh, being a forward air controller. Most people have maybe have heard of FAC. In this case, the pilots and the navigators both were certified to be forward air controllers. That was all, damn near blasphemy because only pilots were allowed to direct aircraft. That is, fortunately, because of what's going on in Afghanistan, that has changed drastically. They get, they get now guys are on the ground doing that. <clears throat> but anyway, the, um, the, the train of thought just slipped, so you're going to have to stop for a second. Uh, what was I talking about, huh? The comm systems. The comm systems. Okay, the comm systems. And um, with this communication systems, we were able to do additional tasks. The group I was with when the first one over was called Big Eagle. We carried flares. We started out flying in the daytime, and we ended up being uh, directing some airstrikes. And <clears throat> We also were a backup control, backup flare ship. We had all the communications, so we could do all kinds of things. Most of the strike aircraft couldn't. An example of uh, the mentality, I won't say the mentality, I'll say the uh, perception people would have when they're over there flying was if they were getting handed off to a FAC, it would be a, an, L, an L-1901 single engine, two passengers, small airplane, right? That might have smoke rockets on it. Well, we were that, but we carried 1,000 pound bombs, 500 pound bombs, uh, all kinds of different things. We had eight machine guns. An example of one of the things we did is we had a flight of four B-57s come over. I called them up. They said, they called us, one of we had a target. We said, yeah. I called them up, what do you got? And I find out they've got a Mark something or other bomb. And so I, call up, I asked him, uh, how many in your flight? He says, four, okay. How, and uh, my AC says, find out how many bombs they got. And uh, I said, how many bombs you got? Four. And then I said, is that each a total? They said, total. So they, they had basically four 250-pound general purpose bombs. Well, what we did, and we were a lot lower. We, we started out at four to 5,000 feet above the ground and dove and pulled up below 2,000. Most of the jets pulled up below above five or 6,000. Anyway, we directed these guys in. They were expecting to see a smoke grenade or a smoke rocket, and you tell them to hit in the direction of the smoke. We dropped the 1,000-pound bomb 
in the middle of the road, sent up a huge pile of dust, and told them to hit our dust. So it was, if you were flying, you would understand why that was slightly humorous. But <clears throat> another example, and I think it, it's the key thing I remember from the K, what it was allowed to do, is our interface in working with uh, the Laotians, the Hmong, under General Vang Pao. He had established uh, working with uh, people we knew, established a communications network and a road system, and we could call them up and say, do you have any traffic in the area? And it'd say, yeah, and he'd let us know. The first time we did this, it was the most impressive thing I had ever seen. We were flying out in Laos, dark as dark could be, and we call up this guy and says, you got anything? He says, my man says he has a truck. Now he, I said, okay, great. My man says he has a truck. And uh, I said, where is the truck? And he gave some coordinates of a hundred and some odd miles away. And I said to him, well, do you know if they've moved any guns into the area? We were worried about anti-aircraft guns. And he says, yes, not to worry. My man say you head north. Okay, we'll trust you, buddy. We fly north for maybe 10 minutes, and then the voice goes back, my man say you head east. Another 10 minutes, my man say you head north. We went through about eight to 10 of these, take this direction five minutes, take this direction for 10 minutes. Now this is nighttime, we had illumination flares, so we could illuminate our own targets or provide illumination for others. And this guy calls up and he says, my man says you're over the truck, okay? So we dropped two flares, one from the left wing, one from the right wing. And it's mountainous valleys. It's about a three second fall, something like that, before the uh, flare ignites. The first one ignited, it was in a tree. The second one was floating over a valley and right underneath it was a truck. And we said, well, this guy knows what he's doing. And, well, the truck sees the flare, and the truck runs off, and he goes through a couple of curves, and he pulls into a small Laotian village. The Laotian village, a lot of the huts would be on stilts to get out of the mosquitoes. And we called the guy up, and we said, yeah, we got the truck, and it went into the village. He says, my men say the truck is under the third house from the east on the north side of the village. And we say, okay, very good, uh, but we don't think we're gonna hit that target. It's only one truck and maybe you have some friends in the area. And the guy calls back and he says, my man says, thank you, it's his house. Now this Laotian was gonna call an airstrike in on his own bloody house and he was in it. Now that was the type of support that the Laotians gave us that people don't realize. The key thing is the K communications allowed you to talk to those people and to do it. I can't think of anything that was more specific and more memorable. I had a 150 some odd missions. I've flown from the far south end down the Umin forest, all the way up to the North Vietnamese border, to the Laotian border, in the B model. In the K model, we were primarily in Laos and occasionally would go over to the coast of Vietnam. So we experienced all, all through that area. But I will never, ever forget that guy saying, my man says thank you. So, you got a question? That's a good story. That's a really, I've not heard anything like that. That. Uh, about the Laotian. That is the two. Because some of the guys complained about the communication in the airplane because your, your compliment was non standard. Well, at that time, 
was no, and, and we didn't have a problem. I didn't have a problem. It was such an improvement over the B, you know. If you're driving, a, you know, a, a 52 Chevy and someone upgrades you to a 68 Buick, that's a great, great improvement, but you'd probably rather have a 98 Cadillac. So it depends upon what you came from as to what you expected. To me, that was a big improvement. And uh, the firepower that we had on that uh, was very, very good for ground support for a very accurate airplane, and they had a lot of uh, ability to take out trucks, which was the primary thing. But as part of that primary thing was working with the Laotians, and we actually, the Laotians actually set up ambushes where we were their firepower. We were providing close air support to guerrillas. Now, I think that happened also in Indochina and in Laos with the same group with the French. And I know it happened with the, the British and Yugoslavia support in Tito. Highly unusual thing, but we were able to do that. There were no other strike aircraft that could communicate, go in, have the ordnance, and be able to hit the target. To me, it was the uh, ideal aircraft for that mission. You were pilot? You I was the NAV. You were the NAV? I was the NAV. How much did your pilot use the guns? Uh, well, we went over early, and we did a lot of daytime stuff, and uh, the guns weren't used that often in the K model, primarily because um, the guys in the ground had bigger guns, and they, if they hit you, you knew it. I did have one example where uh, there were two of us out flying. And uh, <clears throat> we were going to link up with this other airplane, highly unusual, and we're flying over to where we're going to link up. And this guy is making a strafing pass on a target. We didn't see anything. And all of a sudden, there were four lines of traces, perfect square, and he's boxed right in there. They had him laced. And he broke to the left, and the guns followed him. And as soon as the guns saw us in a high perch, the guns immediately stopped. And that's when I said, we got the first team down there. So we ended up, it was close to the dark, and we ended up, we located the thing, and we were able to come in very low level, they were used to guys coming in from 4,000 feet and uh, dropping off in there. We came over at 50 feet. They couldn't do anything about it, and we dropped some uh, napalm and some uh, cluster bomblets, and we set two of the, at least two of the gun pits on fire, maybe three. But then we hung around, and they sent in some F-4s, and the F-4 says, we understand you've got a target. And we said, yeah. And I gave him the coordinates. And he says, that mountain is, he said, well, he said, it's in the valley. He says, so what's the elevation of the target? I says, it's 2,650 feet. And he says, are you sure of that? And I says, yeah, I'm very, very sure. He says, well, how, how positive you are? And how do you know? And I says, because when we went over it, we were 50 feet above it. And I just subtracted 50 feet from the altimeter, and that's what I gave you. I mean, and you get this silence. Well, the guy says, well, we understand there's some anti-aircraft fire in the air. We said, yes. He says, where are the guns? We says, they're the ones burning. Oh, who did that? We did that. I mean, he's expecting a regular fact. So anyway, make a long story short, we ended up, I ended up directing the guy giving him the coordinates, giving him everything else. And like they said, he was 100 yards to the right and two miles too far along. He, 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 they were not accurate at night, the Air Force. 
new guy and whatever, but the K could take out anything. It was not suitable in air to air and marginally suitable where there was radar control because we had no electronic uh, warfare, no radar warning systems, none of that stuff. It was all the Mark I eyeball. We just looked out and saw what we saw. So uh, they say that war and combat is different for everybody. And I have to agree, every, every man is different. My experiences in the B model, entirely different my experiences in the K model. Huh? But the K was great. The Air Force's bigger mis mistake is they only bought 40 of them, and they didn't buy more and send them over because it was the best close air support aircraft. And the A-1 could carry about the same, but it had 20 millimeters. Surprisingly, both were Douglas aircraft, both built by the same guy, Heinemann. Want an attack aircraft? Build an attack aircraft. You want a fighter? Build a fighter. But don't expect to do both. You good questions. No, you're good. <laughs> hmm. What was your first exposure? Well, how did you get to, let's start with the B. Oh. 20, uh, the, but, but it was the B-26 at that time. Yeah. Uh, how did you get to that? Did, did you go from flight training to that airplane? Did you no. fly jets as a trainer student? No, I, I, was, I was a navigator on C-118s which is the DC-6 flying out of McGuire Air Force Base. And they come in one day and said, uh, we're looking for volunteers who, are, you know, we got an interesting thing with you. So I said, yeah, well, let me know about it. Let me so I put my name in and that was, uh, she's not supposed to hear this. Uh, I volunteered for it. And um, anyway, I got the orders that came down in January. And we went out to... At that time, they sent you to Stead yeah, Survival School. And I ended at, at Herbert in probably late March. And I show up here. What year? 1963. And I show up at Herbert Field, and they say, oh, you're, you're flying B-26s. And a, a buddy of mine who also went through Stead, he shows up at the same time, and they say, you're flying C-47s. He had his heart set to fly C-40 B-26s. Eventually, he got in the B-26s. He injured it. Eventually, ended up flying in the K model, and he didn't come home. So Who was that? Burke Morgan was the man's name. He was shot down with uh, John Carr in, I believe, 67. After I had finished uh, four years flying, uh, a, they sent me to uh, engineering school up in uh, Dayton, Ohio, to Affitt. So I got the. Uh, what was your What was your first impression flying the the B twenty six when you first got in there and Okay. You got to the right seat and. My first impression, at that when I got there, you had to fly so many hours in a three month period, or you did not get paid. So it was important to a first lieutenant that he gets paid. And so they said, okay, you can go out and fly with these guys, okay? And I go out, and they had the two seats up front, and they had a little seat in the back called the gunner's seat, and, uh, uh, because at one time they were going to put a 75-millimeter cannon in, in, the, in the B model. Anyway, I'm sitting in there wondering what's going on, and all of a sudden they're flying along, and all of a sudden they start going, flying lower and lower and lower, and all of a sudden I'm looking up at the forestry towers that are over the, over the forests in, in Florida, the flatlands of Florida, so they might have been 75 feet, maybe 80 feet high, and so I went from the back of a transport flying passengers to this thing here that was just zooming along the ground like crazy. That's my first impression. All right? Now, 
sad part of that particular story is those two guys that I flew with went over to Vietnam and their wing came off. They lost it. McLean and Bedell. Two streets over here at Herbert Field named after them. Uh, in the combat experience, um, the first real thing I noticed was that the airplanes sound significantly different when all the nose guns are firing because here in the States we'd only fire two when we were practicing. And when you get six to eight going off, it's noticeably noisier. Cockpit filled with cordite smoke? Uh, yeah, you got all the cordite smoke in there. On the K model, you had the eight guns and you got a lot of smoke there. Originally they had uh, an anti-icing alcohol-based fluid that they would put on the spray on the windshield. And we used to use that to clean the windshield so we could see better coming in to land. It turned out that was a fire hazard, so they took it out. They, they allowed us to carry 1,200 gallons of 115, 145. They allowed octane gasoline. They allowed us to carry 3,000 pounds of 50 caliber. They allowed us to carry uh, 8,000 pounds of high explosives. And they allowed us to carry something like 6,000 pounds of napalm. But they would not allow us to carry alcohol to be sprayed on the windshield. I was not in charge of the Air Force at that time, so I cannot explain their logic. Uh, the, missions, uh, the missions down in the B model were occasionally uh, close support. I did some missions for uh, the Vietnamese in contact, but the vast majority of them were fort defense. And that, that's, an, that's a nice story into itself, but it's not to do with the K. Most of the K models, the flights I got, um, we went out looking for something. It was arm reconnaissance. So, there was an interim between the B-26 and the, and the A-26. What did you do back in the States? Okay, there, there was a period in 65. Uh, in which, in February 65, I believe, they, uh, no, 64. February 64, yeah. They were grounded about yeah, then. They were grounded. They lost the wing on the range out here, right here. in front of a press corps and everything else. So they stopped flying the aircraft. The K models had not arrived. So I got to fly a few months in various type of aircraft, but primarily in the C-46 Commando, which is a, a transport, which was another interesting thing. Uh, also, they gave it. We we flew in some A1 sometimes, and you know, uh, for safety reasons and whatnot. And so did you they didn't like it. Back for the K model as soon as it showed. Oh, up? oh yeah, no, we they were we were programmed to go back to it. Okay. We just were given something to do, so we didn't hang around the squadron or something. But they they needed they needed people so. We did that for maybe three months, if that long, and then we went back to the K and whatnot. There was no problem. Uh, up, I don't remember any really significant problems uh, getting adjusted to the K. It was kind of like a Cadillac. So. Were you around here when Maurice Bourne crashed his? I was here when Maury Bourne, uh, when it, their accident on the range. I was working in the squadron. and uh, January of 65? Yeah, yeah. Um, like yes, it is. It's January '65. Right? Uh, I think the first K model had a problem. Uh, I mean, uh, the first one that was in an accident. Uh, yes, it was an early K model. I don't know what the serial number was, but well, there were only 40 built, so. Um, I got a copy of his accident report, but it's mostly illegible, uh, and it has all the description. And, and I've well, got an hour of Maury talking to me on tape about the accident. Yeah. The thing about Maury and the accident is what he did afterwards. He, for, it ended up they dropped a, a bomb or something uh, at Lola at, at, when they were supposed to drop napalm. Or the, a wrong switch was flipped. Whatever the reason is, I wasn't there. I can only guess. But 
it caused the airplane to, among other things, develop a lot of holes in fire. And Maury either bailed out, or stood up and got sucked out, or jumped out, but he lost his leg. It was ripped off on the way down. It was, yeah, it was January because it was cool. He had long johns on. He had a narrow belt, and he applied a tourniquet. Are you the one that told me he'd never worn a belt before? No. Somebody told me... It's quite possible. ...that he had, you don't normally wear a belt with a flight suit. No, you don't. Well, no, yeah, you don't. And Yeah, you don't. But he had, I think, long johns on, and he was holding them up. That's my recollection. It's only been 48 years, so I might be off a little bit. He does... He does. Re he has remembered. He believes the uh, pilot. One of the two of them got the hatch ejected, thrown off the airplane, and he got loose. And his pilot was indicating for him to go first. And he remembers hands on the sill and foot on the seat, and not much after that yeah. until it, he hit the ground. Yeah. The the amazing part of that it happened on Eglin. Uh, which is a huge base. The, uh, they had rescue helicopters en route almost immediately after the, after the, uh, the accident because they had people on the ground who would, were, were tracking, uh, the controlling the range. And as soon as they saw it, they had an emergency phone. They called up Eglin, Maine, the main base, and they had a helicopter's airborne in, in a few minutes at the most. It took him almost a half hour to get there. Yeah, he said almost an hour. Yeah, it was a half hour or an hour. And during that time, what he had done is he had taken this narrow belt, made a tourniquet, wrapped part around his wrist, and laid back so if he passed out, it got tighter. Mm -hmm. That's how I remember. Murray's a close friend of mine, and uh, a little bit of side humor on that that Maury may not remember. When you bail out of an aircraft, they get the D-ring, you know, thing, or the chute or something like that. And we're in talking with him and his parents are there. He's in the hospital. You know, we're, we're 23, 24 years old and, you know, we're trying to be, keep his spirits up. And I said to him, hey, Maury, we got your chute. And his mother looks at me, and his father looks at me, and I said, yeah, we picked it up there. Do you want it? They thought I had said shoe. The Yankee accent and Texas li listening didn't work out. So they would thought I would told them, we're bringing his shoe back from the lake, and it was his parachute. But anyway, it is humorous now. But that man, Mari, is a most amazing individual. I saw. I met him. Spent a couple hours with him. I hope to get him back to the museum this spring. Among other things he did, was I believe he was working for Continental Air Service in flight scheduling. Uh, he he, uh, he was a nav, but he was a he was also a, a pilot. Had his private pilot's license. And we were at NKP with the K models, and this Laotian marking C forty six pulls out. And Maury gets out of the airplane, he was flying the right seat. So it's a small world sometimes.